Welcome to PowerShell Summit 2021. My name is Ashley McGlone, and this is Give Superpowers Without Giving Away Super Secrets. And we're going to dive straight into a demo that shows you some really bad code with plain text passwords in it and three ways that you can expose those passwords. And then we're going to talk about it. So number one, look at this code we've got on the screen right here. This is bad stuff. You've got this classic move, convert to secure string as plain text with a plain text password right there in the script. We've got a fake API key here that would be used by invoke rest method. So uh, this is bad stuff, right? You've got, and again, this is just made up. It's You've never used a script like this, hopefully. But just to show some examples of secrets in a script, all right? So now if we run this script, not so secret, I'm going to run it with PowerShell. So it's now over here running, and we've got a, a timer down here that makes sure that it stays in memory long enough for us to experiment with it. So over here in a, another PowerShell session on this box, uh, first things first is I'm going to run a script called uh, show me the money, which is going to uh, query for us the Windows event log. We're just running get win event, looking at the PowerShell logs. Because we have logging turned on on this machine, we're going to look for event ID 4104 or event ID 4103. And you can see there in this query from the event logs, the uh, plain text secrets right there in the Windows event log. And we go back up through here. There's the 4103 event. So you can see these secrets in the Windows PowerShell event log if um, the logging is turned on. That's why I recommend when you do turn on logging, which I do recommend, that you harden those logs and hide them from everyday users. Now, that's, that's one method that will show you uh, credentials running on the box. Here's another method. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, process ID of our current session, 5940. All right. And now what we're going to do is get dash ps host process info. And you can see that we've got this other process running. This is kind of a uh, super duper behind the scenes trick. So we are going to uh, then enter that ps host process of ID. Uh, three, five, five, six. Now, as they say in the movies, I'm in. Now I'm actually on the same machine in, as a, I have to do this as an administrator, but now, and this is why you don't give administrator rights to your users, okay? So I'm an admin on the box. There's another PowerShell process running in memory. I have just now tapped into that PowerShell process. So now if I do get run space, uh, here's a list of run spaces within that PowerShell process, and I can do a debug run space and ID 1. Now, if you've ever used a debugger in ISE, you'll no notice that you can step in, step out, things like that, uh, hit a break point. So that's what we've done. Here is the command line debugger, and if we were running this exact same command in the ISE, it would just show you all the code right away. But instead, I can just list it here in the command line debugger, and see on the screen in plain text, there is the string and there is the password. Now pretend that this is a script that you ran on an end user's machine that had admin rights. They could run these commands to peek over into that other PowerShell process live in memory. Not only that, they can interact with uh, the variables that are in memory. So they could do dollar cred here in your script and they could do uh, get network credential dot, dot password, and they can see that. They can interact with it. And so that's not cool, right? That's another way. I'm going to go ahead and exit that process here. So that's the uh, debugger that I can attach as an admin to another PowerShell process running in memory. And then lastly, uh, the good old-fashioned task manager. Check this out. Um, I can dump the memory of a PowerShell process right here. I'm going to create a dump file, dumping what's going to happen. All right, here's the file name. I'm going to copy this file name. All right, copy that file name. And I'm going to open that dump file. And I'm using Notepad++ because this is a very large file. And if I search for let's say cred, which was the keyword we found in the script earlier. Find next, find next. There it is right there. Dollar creds, new PS credential. 
And if we scroll across, there's the argument list. We're looking at our code here. Let's look for that uh, as plain text string that we saw earlier. There it is. There is in the dump file of that PowerShell process. Here you can see there's our plain text password again. Now, I probably need admin rights. I don't know. Maybe I don't to uh, dump a process from Task Manager. But there you go, three out-of-the-box ways that you can dump credentials out of a, a PowerShell script running on your box that you didn't initiate as an admin. That's why you don't give admin rights to your users and you don't run with plain text data in your scripts that are running in your user lane environment. How was that for an opening demo? Now, I have to say, remember what Mark Manassi always says, use your powers for good and not for evil, okay? So we're demonstrating the vulnerability there. Be careful how you use that ability. So welcome to Give Superpowers Without Giving Away Super Secrets. My name is Mr. Ashley McGlone, and I've been honored to present at the PowerShell Summit every year since 2014. It's been a delight. I really miss being together with you all in the halls and in the session rooms and hanging out in the lobby at the hotel, and hopefully we'll be back to that soon. But uh, My name is Ashley McGlone. Like I said, I work for a company called Tanium. Prior to that, I worked for Microsoft. At Tanium, I have a new role now called Technology Strategist, and you can catch up with me on Twitter at GoTPFE if you have any questions after our session today. So let's dive right into our session. So here's an outline of what we're going to do today. Uh, number one was the old crap demo, right? Oh no, they can see our credentials. Next, we're going to define the problem. Then we're going to show you the cool kids way of handling credentials in your scripts, and then we'll explain what it takes to make that happen. So the problem. The problem is people put passwords in scripts, you name it, whatever kind of secrets they can come up with, some people find a way to stick those in a script, and it's not cool, right? Bad actors or hackers like it when you do this. InfoSec wants to find you and do things to you when you do this, and those secrets show up in logging. Now, the CIS benchmarks, the Center for Internet Security, they tell you don't turn on PowerShell logging, but I tell you to turn it on, but then make sure to harden that. I've got a toolkit to do that. Maybe ask me about it later. And also, this is the most important thing I want you to take away from the session today. I really do care about you, your family, your company. And when you put passwords and plain text and secrets in your scripts, you are literally jeopardizing your company and your own livelihood. What if you're the person that caused your business to show up on the front page of every news headline across the world as the next major breach? You don't want to be that person. All right, so have you ever played peekaboo with a two-year-old or a three-year-old and they cover their face and you can't see me? Well, uh, yes, I can still see you. And uh, it doesn't matter what you do to try to cover up those passwords you've put in your scripts, whether you've done a base64 encoded command or a compiled executable or maybe even putting it in a secure string. But then, as you saw with that debug technique, even if it's in the code as a secure string, we can still interact with that object in memory. So don't do that. There are these three methods I just showed you as ways that you can expose those passwords in memory. I'm sure there's plenty more that you can come up with. These are free out of the box. Just don't do it, okay? The answer is just enough administration. So this way you can keep your secrets on a tool server behind a constrained PowerShell remoting session where people prying eyes can't get to that. They would have to have admin rights to the server to see the credentials that you posted there. And so this way, when you deploy your scripts to user land out on the global enterprise, there's no secrets in that code. And this can be for interactive operators who are running the script interactively and need to access a backend system, or it can be just for non-interactive automation processes that just need to reach back into a system with a credential. You can call into GIA first and then hide that credential behind just enough administration. This is the way. 
All right, so I've got a demo use case we're going to go through now and show you how is a better way to manage those. So here's the situation. The help desk needs to look up data on users and computers from multiple sources. Typical scenario, okay? It's manual. It takes a lot of time. And we don't want to give um, level one operators access or credentials directly to all these consoles that they need to get into. And we don't want to add them to a bunch of extra security groups that could further compromise the environment. And we don't want to distribute a script with embedded credentials. Whatever method you've tried in the past, like I just showed you, you can see those creds. So here's what our demo scenario is going to do. We're going to prompt the help desk operator for a username. And that username from the user calling in, then we're going to take it. And in this particular demo, uh, I've got three different backend systems that we're going to query for data without credentials given to the operator. So we're going to use Tanium because I work for Tanium. We've got an API. We'll show that uh, in the demo. So what the Tanium is going to do is it's going to go query all the machines in the environment in real time and tell us if that username is logged in on any computer in the environment. They're going to take that computer name where they're logged in, query Active Directory for some of the properties of that computer. And then we also have our API for our identity management application that has the user's passphrase that they need to give to the help desk in order for us to service them to make sure they're a legitimate user. And so all of these three credentials, an Active Directory username and password, Tanium username and password, and an API key are all stored securely away from prying eyes on the GS server. So that is the demo that we're about to watch as we see how to do this correctly. For over the misty mountains cold To dungeons deep and caverns old We must away at break of day To find our long forgotten password. Kring, Shire Support Center, this is Frodo. How can I help you? Oh, hello, Gollum. Uh, one second, let me look up your machine here with my handy dandy PowerShell script. We'll see if I find you logged in anywhere in the Realm of Middle Earth. Oh, I don't see you logged into any computer. Oh, you, you're having trouble getting logged in. Um, you're in a cave? Oh, um, try going outside the cave by the riverbank. Maybe you can get a, a hotspot signal there. Oh, yeah, I know Mordor is one big hotspot. Yeah, um, yeah, that would be precious. Try it outside. Call me back later. Bring Shire Support Center. This is Frodo. How can I help you? Oh, hello, Gimli. Let me uh, check your uh, account here. You know, we have this process with the help desk. We need to know your passphrase uh, before. No, please don't plant your battle axe in the computer. And no, please don't put your battle axe up there. No, <laughs> no, thank you. Um, so I have your passphrase here. I have your computer information. If you could just give me your passphrase, I'd be glad to help you. I'm sorry. No, I'm not short on time. I've got all day. Okay, we'll call back when you can remember your passphrase. Shire Support Center, this is Frodo. How can I help you? Oh, hello, Gandalf. Let's check. Uh, one second, let me look up your computer here. Yeah. And it looks like we're uh, checking now, uh, seeing where you're logged in here across Middle Earth somewhere. Uh, one second. Okay, now you know we have to we have to have your passphrase before we can help you here on the support desk. I've got your information in front of me. I'd be glad to help, but I just need to know your passphrase. Oh, you don't remember? I'm sorry, Gandalf. Without your passphrase, you shall not pass. My apologies to any of you Lord of the Rings purists. I know I mixed a lot of things together there. Hope you enjoyed that little demo. So now let's talk about G, just enough administration. This is super granular access that gives you 
amazing level of control over exactly what a user can do in a PowerShell remoting session. And that's how we achieved our outcome that we demonstrated with the Shire Support Center there, giving them a convenient script, no password required, nothing in the script, and we'll show you what that script looked like here in just a minute in the lab. So let's take a look here. What is Just Enough Administration? Just Enough Administration is a uh, PowerShell remoting session configuration. And then within that session configuration, you're going to have these permissions. Let's talk about those permissions here. So number one, at the Windows server or workstation for that matter, it's just PowerShell remoting on a Windows box, uh, you've got firewall. So it's WinRM coming in. So automatically you can, at the network layer, filter who has WinRM access to this box to run any PowerShell remoting commands whatsoever. And that has nothing to do with GIA. That's just OS capabilities there. You can also uh, use uh, groups to control access to the server and ACLs on resources, things like that. So baseline OS capabilities. But on top of that, then, when you do a PowerShell remoting session, you can do uh, what we call a PS session configuration. In that PS session configuration that you connect to, then you specify a GIA um, module. So you'll have a GIA module on the server and then within that configuration, within a GIA session, then you're going to define Active Directory users or groups or both that have access to specific roles. And I like to think of these roles like a toolbox. So classic situation, let's say you've got somebody who's uh, administering the network configuration of the server, maybe you give them the network commandlets. Maybe somebody else is administering something in the file system, you'll give them the file system commandlets. And you can explicitly give an allow list or grant permissions uh, only to the things you want them to have access to. That goes for the file system, the registry, all those providers that you're familiar with in PowerShell. You literally have to allow every piece of the PowerShell interface within this role capability. And then beyond that, there are also conditional access rules where you can further specify com combinations of groups that have access this group but not that group type of logic. Now, uh, the account options, when you uh, are operating inside a GIA session, what is the security context? The preferred method is the virtual account here, the virtual admin access. Uh, you have local admin on the box, and typically this is intended for resources that are only on the local box. If you try to leave the local box, you're going to look like the dollar sign computer account on other network resources, and that's usually not as friendly. But as a, as a virtual account, you have, uh, by default, local admin on that box. This is a temporary disposable account. Uh, group Managed Service Account, GMSA, is the next, again, best practice to use here uh, because this one you can configure on the server typically, and that will then give you network access to resources off the box where you've granted domain level permissions to that GMSA. Now, you can do a pass-through authentication where uh, whoever is connecting from their own logged-in user security context on their remote machine passes through to that remoting session on the box. If you do that, that means you have to grant that user or their group access to resources directly on that server. That's what we're trying to avoid. We don't want to have to grant extra access it works, but it kind of defeats the purpose of our additional security layers. And that leaves us with, uh, finally, you can specify a run as credential. So when you connect to a PowerShell uh, session configuration, a remoting session, you can tell it to run under a different account, which means you have to cache that password in there. It's not exposed. It's hidden in the Windows uh, OS under the covers. But the problem here is that it doesn't then allow you to use the, the GIA role capabilities that are assigned by users and groups. It kind of breaks that ability. So if you're not doing GIA and you're just doing a straight PowerShell session configuration, you could do that, but you're going to miss out on the benefits of GIA. So that's kind of the, as we're talking about security here, those are the options as you come through. Now, if you run the commandlet get ps session configuration, this is on a Windows server or workstation where remoting is enabled, and you'll notice uh, out of the box there are four 
different uh, session configurations. One of those is Microsoft.PowerShell. That's the default one. The second one on the screen here, and you'll notice that by default, built-in administrators have uh, access to that. That's why normally we say that if you're going to do PowerShell remoting, it requires admin access on the box. Technically, there's this remote management users group there as well, but by default, that's what we're used to working with. And when you access and you do an invoke command or enter PS session, you're going to get that administrative full access to the box. However, in our scenario here, we've created an alternative PS session configuration called GoT Tools. And for that GoT Tools session configuration, only members of the GoT Tools users group are allowed access. So Frodo in our demonstration earlier was a member of that group which allowed him to connect through that PS session configuration. Uh, I, I kind of like to talk about it like badging in a door. So if you got badge access to the server room, that's one thing. If you got badge access to the broom closet, you're not going to be able to do much in there, right? So we've got badge access for Frodo here, but just to this tools configuration endpoint with very limited capabilities. Very powerful, but limited and we didn't have to grant him any additional access. So I want to break this down for you architecturally. This picture right here will really help you understand the layers of security that we're talking about. Straight off the top, enter PS session dash computer name. A lot of us do this, or if you use invoke command dash computer name, right? That's connecting to that default uh, Microsoft PowerShell PS session configuration with unlimited access and uh, that's going to give you all access to all commands, uh, the full box access. But then what we can do is we can create our own PS session configuration. We'll do this in the lab in a second. And inside there, then we're going to create, uh, we have a GM module. It's just in that Windows um, program files path for Windows PowerShell modules. You're going to drop your GM module under there. And that GM module is going to have the custom functions and definition of capabilities of which commandlets, which modules, which custom functions are going to be available to the users of that session configuration. Now, here's the other interesting part. I can have a single uh, light blue box there, the PowerShell session configuration. Within that, maybe just one GM module, but within that GM module, we can have multiple role capabilities. Okay, now the role capabilities are where you define this group or user gets these permissions. So here, role capability A could be, in our example, the network commandlets, whereas role capability B for a different group of users, when they connect to the same uh, remoting endpoint, they get a different set of tools. They ran the same command to get in there, but based on their group membership, they get a different PowerShell experience. So uh, that's the beauty of GIA, as you're able with uh, a single configuration to guarantee an experience of different groups of users. And you can uh, basically look at the uh, daily administrative needs of someone accessing a server, and then take those, capsulate them inside a role capability, and ask them to use the uh, PowerShell remoting endpoint to get there and restrict their access to only the things that they need. That's the intent behind GIA. Now, the one thing you need to be aware of is if you RDP remote desktop into the server as administrator, this all goes away. It doesn't mean anything. If you have admin access directly to the server, then the, the game's over. Now, you've already got all the access. This is explicitly for remote PowerShell administration access. Now, I've taken the liberty of copying and pasting literally straight from the docs some of the things here about run as virtual accounts, uh, some things you want to understand. So um, different ways that you can operate those credentials like we mentioned earlier. So a virtual account is a temporary account that's unique to that session uh, for GIA. It does not have a persistent um, profile on the server. It's just there for the duration of the session. Typically, it's local access to the box. And uh, by default, it's going to be a member of the administrator's group unless you specify the groups that it should be a member of. And then it's only going to have those group memberships. On a domain controller, I don't know if I would want people using GIA on a domain controller. It, it's, the, it's the best way to secure it. And maybe it's just my personal um, idea. If you have to have access to a domain controller for somebody, maybe this is the way to do it. 
I would rather give them that uh, those commandlets on a member server rather than giving them direct access to a domain controller. But if you did, then that virtual account is going to be a member of the domain admins. Not a cool thing, right? So probably shouldn't do that. So uh, virtual accounts are a best practice here. Uh, really a lot of flexibility over what that account can do without granting anyone explicit access to the box. And that's the beauty of it. Group managed service accounts. Again, like we said earlier, if you need to get off the box to access uh, file shares or web services, other machines within the domain, you can use this GMSA identity that you've assigned already those resources on other machines in the domain. It gives them the rights they need to access that. And uh, by default, this does not automatically have admin rights on the box unless you specifically granted those to that GMSA outside of the GIA context. The other interesting thing here is that, is, is that this does enable second hop, you know, the old Kerberos second hop. So computer A to computer B, but then from computer B to computer C, I get access denied because I can't uh, bridge my ticket like that. However, now you've got fresh credentials on computer B which allows you then to access computer C. So this is a way that you can get around that second hop limitation if that applies to your situation. Now, the other thing that you should keep in mind while you're doing this, you probably want to have an idea of who is using GIA, what they're doing. As part of the configuration, number one, on the server all up, you should have PowerShell logging and transcription already enabled on that server. But then additionally, when you define that uh, GIA configuration, you can specify an additional transcription directory that will be just remoting for that GIA session being logged. So you can specify a different transcription directory so you can differentiate between things that happened locally on the server by other admins versus people connecting through your GIA endpoint. It gives you some flexibility there in your logging. This applies to script block logging, module logging as well. Obviously, you're not going to be able to tailor those. Those are going to show up beside all the other normal activity there in the event log. Now, what do you look for in the transcription is what you'll see in that transcript is you'll see this WinRM virtual user, and it will have in the name this uh, random number, the domain, and the same account name. So you can look for that to see uh, what was the virtual account that things were running under, and it should also show you the remote user ID in the transcript now that was connected running under that identity. And that's a feature you'll only find in the transcription. That's why I recommend that you turn it on when you set this up. You might be wondering this new hotness, the uh, secret store module. Why wouldn't we use the secret store module on that tool server? Uh, the problem there is that the secret store, as it is today in its first production release recently, it stores that secret vault within the local user profile. The virtual user account or the GMSA, they're not going to have a persistent uh, user profile on that server. So that's one reason why we wouldn't. Then the other reason is you still have to figure out how do I secure the password to unlock the secret store, right? So it's just kind of moving uh, the cheese, so to speak. Now I've got to figure out how do I protect that other password. So these are some of the considerations uh, as you look at implementing GIA, a little bit about it, how it works. Obviously, there's a lot more to it to that. Those are some of the things you can think about. So now what I want to do is go into the lab here and let's look behind the scenes, see how this was configured, and then we'll go back through that um, Shire Support Center experience again and with a little bit more knowledge of what's actually going on behind the scenes. Okay, here we are on the tool server behind the scenes. Let's take a look now and see how this was created. And I've got some links I'll share with you at the end. I did a, a session back at the 2019 PowerShell Summit where we talked through uh, some remoting scenarios and security and auditing and logging. And this GIA demo um, actually was modified from that. There's some great training out there to learn GIA from scratch. So I took some of that and I tailored it here. So when you create a GIA module, you're just going to basically tweak these settings and run this uh, patch of code here. And what it's going to do is you're going to build under the program files directory under Windows PowerShell and modules, you're building out a GIA module, whatever you want to call it there. That's going to be your module path. And then within that module path, you're going to create a GIA functions PSM1 module file. That's going to be empty by default. 
then you're going to create a new module manifest, and uh, you're going to give it that module path with the PSD1 module manifest extension and tell it that the root module is that group of GIA functions. So that's what you're going to put your functions into. We'll take a look at those in a second. And functions are optional, by the way. In this particular case, uh, we need those functions because we need access to backend systems that we don't have default uh, commandlets for. Now, uh, then you're going to create a role capability. So the way we do that is under the module path here that we've calculated, we're going to create a directory called role capabilities, and we're going to do a new item for that role capability folder, and then move our location there, and then we're just going to end that folder then, uh, just do a quick directory to see what's there. So this is the file structure. We'll take a look in just a second. And then, uh, once we've got that module directory created in that file structure, what we're going to do next is create a role capability file. Okay, So the role capability file, we're going to give it a description, any visible functions, and this is really stripped down. Normally here you would say these are the modules, the providers, all the different resources, the commandlets, the functions that a user would have access to. In this case, it's strictly this one custom function that we're going to use. And we're going to run the command to build that new role capability file, passing in this hash table of parameters here. And that's going to go into that role capability directory as a PSRC, PowerShell role capability file. Now, uh, that file is there and the directory structure is there, now we have to create the actual PowerShell session configuration that will reference it. So here are the parameters for our PowerShell session configuration. And notice here we've got our session type, our language mode, our execution policy, and then run as virtual account. It says, hey, we're going to use one of those special virtual accounts we talked about earlier. And then this is the magic for GIA right here is it links this uh, role definition that we built over here, role capability called goatee tools, all right, that's going to be linked to this group goatee domain, goatee tools users. So anybody that connects to this remoting configuration, this PowerShell session configuration, with a member of this group is going to get access to this role capability. And refer back to that diagram we showed you earlier, that'll be helpful there. So we create the new configuration file in that path. And then we can use the test to make sure that all the syntax is valid. If you manually edit it, you might want to make sure you run that. And then we're going to register that remoting configuration for Goatee Tools as the remoting endpoint. And then we can take a look at that module path. So what happens when that's done is over here, if you'll notice, we have the uh, Program Files, Windows PowerShell, Modules, Goatee G is the module that it created. Here we've got the PSM1 module file with our custom functions, uh, the PSD1 uh, for the manifest. Then and that's the metadata around the file, the module, right? And then inside of there's the role capabilities. And so here we have the tools and the uh, GIA config. So uh, that's all there now and waiting on somebody to connect remotely. The other thing we have to do in this case is we're talking about secrets management. So uh, what I've done is I've created a working tools directory on this same tool server. So I've created a tools go TGA directory. There's some disclaimers that go with this, okay? We are creating a private key right here that's going to be used to encrypt the credentials. So if anybody has admin rights to this server, they'll be able to go in and decrypt those credentials. They would have to look at the code and uh, reverse out the credentials, decrypt them that way. But on disk, there's nothing that's stored in plain text. And in the script, there's nothing stored in plain text. You might have other methods that you want to use to do this <clears throat> for private key management. For now, that's uh, how we're doing it in this particular example. And we're calling that file sauce.dat. In other words, the secret sauce. That's our private key that we're going to use to encrypt these things. Then uh, what I'm going to do to set this up is I'm going to prompt for the password of the AD service account that's going to be used to access Active Directory, and in this case, our Tanium um, API. And so I'm going to prompt for that, grab the password from it. And there's multiple ways you can do this. Probably the easier way is just to export it as an XML object. But for now, we're just encrypting only the password converting it from that secure string, using the key here that we just generated, that private key, 
the sauce, and we're setting that out to the content of cred.dat. And then for our uh, special line of business application, the Lord of the Rings API, uh, so you have to go out to their website, sign up for an API key, and here again, I did not enter it in plain text in the script. I'm prompting as a secure string to paste in that API key, and then it gets encoded, or I shouldn't say encoded, encrypted with that uh, private key and goes out to the API key.dat. So that is in my uh, working directory over here, and so I've got API key.dat, for example, now if I uh, open that up, uh, with, let's say, Notepad++ here. You see it's just a bunch of scrambled characters, all right? So if I look at any one of these, uh, cred.dat or uh, sauce.dat, you're not going to see any password there. Um, now, this is the actual uh, private key in the directory. So what happens is the remote user with normal privileges connects in through this session, and then uh, what happens is the module file then that gets loaded up in that custom session is going to call. Uh, this is the custom function that the user has access to. There are other functions in this module. This is the only one that was on the allow list in the remoting configuration for GIA that they were able to run. Once they're inside that script, then uh, it's going to have the name of that user account. Again, you don't necessarily have to expose the username. You could use the other method to encrypt that in the file as well. Um, but then I've got my, uh, now these are the jewels I'm trying to protect, right? Here's the IP to my team server on the network. And I'm going to set my uh, working location for this script to that tools directory where those credentials are securely stored on the server. And then I'm going to read in those credentials. Here's my service account username. I'm going to grab that secure password, uh, the cred.dat file, and then convert it from uh, to a secure string, passing in that special private key again. And then I'm going to use the, and this is all standard documented procedures. This has been around for a long time in the world of PowerShell to reassemble that credential object with the uh, username and password that we're going to use. And then similar with the API key, there's no username and password here, but I'm just going to decrypt that API key in the DAP file that's encrypted and then convert it back into plain text. Um, again, not exposed in the script, but used in memory uh, while the script is running here uh, to grab that. So then what you saw in the demo was the user experience as we cleared the screen. And then we call a helper function called get Tanium computer last user. So we prompt for the username. And uh, then we uh, we ask them who what's the user here. Uh, we probably did that. Yeah, actually, that was passed in uh, as a parameter, sorry. So yeah, we've got this username parameter that's being called from the endpoint. When I typed in Gimli's name, for example, it was passed as a parameter here. And so then we call Tanium helper function to go look up that username. And again, I'm just using Tanium as an example. You've got tons of APIs and line of business apps that you could use to do this. And then it's going to print out if it can't find it. Hey, remember, uh, Gollum was not currently logged on to a computer. We couldn't find it. Uh, but if we could find them, then what we'll do is we'll take a look at that Tanium data coming back because it's going to scan the environment in real time, find where's that user actively logged in right now. And then we're going to pass that computer name that we retrieved from the Tanium data, pass that over to uh, test AD computer. So uh, we'll pass in that host name with the credential that we uh, decrypted. And then we'll, over here, test AD computer is going to go out and do a get AD computer and retrieve certain properties from that computer. And you see we're going to have an array of properties coming back that you saw on the display there. And then if it doesn't work, we'll throw an error, right? So that's the, the, uh, the AD lookup, which is it gets passed. So Tanium takes the username, finds the computer name. Then that computer name gets passed to Active Directory to look it up. Then also, so we explain, we show that data. And then uh, we also do this uh, get user security passphrase. And again, this is just all made up and contrived out of the blue to make this kind of fun. So now we're going to call this helper function with that API key that we decrypted and the username. So we come down here, and uh, here's the uh, Tanium helper function that we called just a second ago. And then we've also, down here, we've got the get user security passphrase. Uh, which uh, Gimli was really struggling to remember what its passphrase was, wasn't it? So this is actually making two REST method calls out to the API. One retrieves the, you know, Gimli or Gandalf, retrieves their character ID, 
And then we go into the Lord of the Rings API and we find, okay, based on that character ID, let's retrieve a movie quote from them. And we're using that then as their uh, passphrase. We're just taking a random one of those movie quotes that come back to be their passphrase when they try to uh, contact the service desk for support. So we've uh, taken all these custom uh, logic functions and we've put them then in this uh, helper directory here for the module, this GoTGA functions PSM1 file contains these custom functions then that will get called uh, when we do this. So I think it would be helpful uh, if we did this one more time now so you can see it all work. And notice what happens as I'm going to run the command prompt here as a different user first off. And uh, Bob is not a member of that group. I want you to see what happens uh, when Bob tries to run this. Okay, so who am I? I'm Bob. And now I'm going to go to my tools directory and I'm going to run the help desk batch file. So imagine somebody else in the enterprise gets access to the help desk batch file and now they're trying to run this. Notice what it's doing. It's saying invoke command against our tool server in the lab with the configuration name called GoT Tools. That's the secret right there. Is it? It's knocking on, it's badging in that door called GoT Tools, and when it gets there, it's going to run this script block, which is that uh, helper function that we created, passing in the username that they answer to the read host prompt. So here, I'm going to put in uh, Gimli again, but watch what happens. I get an error because Bob is not a member of that group. He gets access denied. So uh, let's try this. Let's, uh, let's try this again. And this time, we're going to run under a different ID. This time, we're going to log in as Frodo, who is a member of that group, when we run our special uh, session here. And I'm going to drop over to my tools directory. And before I, uh, actually, let's, let's do this. Uh, let's run PowerShell real quick as Frodo as well, so you can see this. Okay, so now I'm in as who am I? I'm Frodo. And if I do an enter PS session computer name ws2019-1.goT.lab. All right, that's my server. Notice I get this access is denied, right? Because I'm trying to get to something I don't have access to. But if I do dash come through configuration name goT tools, now notice it lets me in. So what do I get when I'm in the goT tools? Let's do a get command. And notice the only commands that he has are some really basic harmless commands and that custom function. So now here in this interactive session, I can type get computer of user details. Now, I cannot use tab complete because that's actually a custom function that has to be allowed in the session. It's not even allowed. I, and I'm going to guess, I already know it's the username parameter and I'll put Gimli here and we'll run it and now it's looking and it's actually running interactively here uh, but if you had to coach your help desk on how to run that interactively that would be a real pain wouldn't it because then they have to figure all those things out and we can see it's working it's looking up in team looking up in AD looking up in the, uh, the API so I want to exit out of there and exit out of there so what makes this easy then let's do this let's do notepad on Help desk so what we're doing in this batch file is we're clearing the screen, running PowerShell, and we're prompting for the username with read host. And then once we get the username, we're going to do an invoke command against that remote tool server. And then we're going to badge into that special door called GoT Tools. And from there, we're going to call our custom function, passing in that username using the special dollar using syntax to get it from my local session into that remote session. You can look that up later in the about topic for that. So that's what's happening here. So now if I run the help desk bat, help desk bat. Now, uh, one user we've not spoken with yet today would be Galadriel. Galadriel, uh, the elven lady. So let's see where she's logged in. 
And the fun thing here is when you look up the uh, movie lines, sometimes they come up in like Elvish <laughs> rather than human language. So anyway, uh, here we can see we've looked, we looked up, we found her actual user ID from AD, and we've got her uh, passphrase, which comes out of Lord of the Rings API. We've got the um, <clears throat> this detail all comes from Tanium, telling us the, the currently logged on workstation where she resides in the Enterprise. She's on running Windows 10 on 2004, pretty recent release there. Here's her IP address all coming from Tanium, and then we can see if we need to do any maintenance on that computer account from the AD side. Here's where it's located in the OU structure. And the computer password date is uh, within the last 30 days, it's fresh. That's the way AD computer passwords work. So we see uh, as of the date of this recording that her uh, password for the computer account's fresh. So that's again just a contrived example to show you how GIA could work to hide credentials from the end user. So notice here Frodo running this command does not need any special access to the back end server. It's all running under that virtual account in GIA. Okay, now it's your turn. I know you came to this session for a reason. You probably want to learn some of these techniques. So I'm going to give you a GitHub link in just a second. It's going to have a link to all the resources from today, all the sample scripts, all the things I used to create this scenario. It's all documented out there with walkthrough for you. Now, this is non-trivial. In other words, this is hard. I wish it were easier. Um, for me, having done this uh, for a few number of years, I should say, it's a little easier but it still takes me some uh, calculation to make sure it all gets through all the right little hoops. So if you're seeing this the first time, I completely get it. Your head's probably spinning. I know I've sat in plenty of these summit sessions where my head was spinning too, so you're right at home with everybody else. Don't worry about it. But this is uh, something that you can learn and a really good skill for you to enhance the security of your automation environment. So everything is there in the GitHub repo. Take a look through it. You have a couple of these slides as well to refer back to for some of those key diagrams. Now, I use Tanium API in this example. I know a lot of everybody has that. And that was just a demo. Uh, feel free to take this and customize it to your environment. This is just a proof of concept for you to take and adjust. Uh, also, this will require customization in your environment. Obviously, you can't drop this in and work instantly. So you take it into your environment, tweak up some of the service accounts, some of the APIs and keys and so forth that you're using, but you've got all the pieces out on the workbench now that you can begin to customize into your environment. And again, just want to make the disclaimer, if somebody has admin access to this server, then they can have the ability, if they understand, then they can decrypt those keys, uh, the security values there on the file system. Nothing's in plain text, but it's encrypted on the box. So at some point, at the end of the day, you have to trust your people. And that's uh, an HR issue, right? Uh, in this uh, zero trust environment these days, we have to be really careful where we store those things. So, so that's where the buck stopped is on that server. But the good news is you are not giving a plain text or encoded password out to thousands of user machines where it can be exposed and cause your company to end up in the headlines. So here's the link. Uh, you can head out to GitHub bit.ly slash ps2021gia. That link will take you out there. You'll get all the resources there. And I tried to write up a pretty thorough walkthrough on how to rebuild this in your environment where you need to customize things. So thank you for joining me today for this session. Give superpowers without giving away super secrets. And you can find me on Twitter if you'd like to interact more. Go to PFE. You can also see, see me around the conference in the virtual conference vendor booth area. You can catch me at the Tanium booth there as well. Thank you for joining me today. And again, it's been my pleasure to present this to you because I really want to see you have proper security hygiene in your environment when it comes to using PowerShell, especially at scale across the enterprise. So enjoy the rest of the conference.